This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. I am here with Tammy Evans of TammyEvans.com, one of the busiest and smartest and most jet-setting professional speakers on the circuit today. Welcome, my friend. Thank you, David. I will put you in my pocket and take you everywhere I go with an introduction like that. It's the intro that pays the (laughs) bills. I'm telling you, oh, you have to talk to Tammy Evans. She's awesome. So let's just have some fun because recently we had a couple of our mutual friends on the speaking show. Two words about the amazing Phil Jones. Episode 35, in case you're wondering, Phil Jones. Phil Jones, blue-eyed eloquence. Ooh, so Phil's changing his one sheet right now. Uh, (laughs) Second one, episode number 31, Jay Bear, CSP, CPAE. Jay Bear, exceptional alpaca. (laughs) (laughs) Totally fantastic. All right, now let's spend the rest of the show talking about Tammy Evans. Blue-eyed alpaca. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Busy alpaca. Tell us how you got started in this crazy business. I'd love to hear the backstory. I mean, you and I have been sort of friends, friendly for years and years and years. I have no idea how you got started in this crazy business and what you did before. And give us like the three minute launch story. Yeah. Wow. So I find it so interesting to ask the same question of all of our colleagues because there is just no one who came to be sitting where they are by the the same route. So I grew up in the great state of Michigan. Show, show me your hand map. And there I very, from a very early age, was involved in performing arts. So my undergraduate was in communication broadcasting. I started as a weather girl and moved into a newscaster and then went on to get my Master of Fine Arts with the Hillbury Repertory Theater Program. And so I have a Master of Fine Arts in Performance. And uh, through those experiences, I connected with Jeff Daniels, the actor, Hollywood and Broadway actor, who also lives and runs a theater company in Michigan that I helped start called the Purple Rose Theater Company. I was also teaching at university at the time, teaching communication skills and performance, uh, speaking. And then with Jeff's support, I moved to New York City and got a job on a daytime soap opera, One Life to Live, bum, 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 and worked in bit roles all over the place, um, did a few films. I worked on Sex in the City, uh, season six. I worked on a few films, uh, Woody Allen films, Stepmom, things like that, and really hated my life in the entertainment industry because there's zero control for the performer. The entertainment industry is really owned and operated by directors and producers and the creative types who actually put things together. So on One Life to Live, I met a fellow actor who got me freelancing in the fabric room for Banana Republic, the design company. It was Gap, Banana Republic, and Old Navy. And only in New York, kids, uh, I ended up on the design team for Banana Republic for three years as an assistant designer and worked my way through the fashion industry until I was... Did you have any design skills or...? (laughs) Well, I was an illustrator. So I was doing a line of greeting cards that sold in Times Square. Wow. Yeah, this could be a very long three minutes. Anyway, the reason the Banana Republic story is so important is because I was promoted up through corporate management. And so I really understood about the creative side of a business and then moved into the executive and uh, management side of the business. So that journey, those two yin and yang of a business, particularly how to run a creative business, our cornerstone in me running my own business now and also being able to talk to my you know, corporations, associations, and organizations around the country. How about that? Wow. So that's fantastic. So when that's you- leading up to, and I just, the one little leap that we're missing is that, so it came to pass that I was doing a performance fundraiser and had lunch with an old friend of mine from undergrad that I hadn't seen in many, many, many years. And at the time I was performing and doing voiceover work and teaching at university and had lunch with this person who told me about the speaking industry. And when I shared my story with her, she said, oh my God, you have to be a speaker. And it was at that lunch that Christine Cashin, 
said, this is your journey. And I said, this is exactly what I'm going to do. And from that moment, she really just, (laughs) I would say took me under her wing, but it's more like flopped me on her back, flew up into the air and said, this is how you flap your wings now, let's do it. And really just, you know, put wind under my wings at every opportunity. So I would, you know, bring her up for questions and just learned about the business and just jumped in literally both feet, no safety net. And uh, there's many (laughs) levels of that statement, but just jumped in and really connected with NSA and, you know, with Christine's guidance in NSA, I am where I am today. So that launch was with Christine. Yes. I had no idea this world existed. And uh, she introduced me to this world. And, you know, to this day is one of my best friends in the world. I consider her a sister. I mean, anyone who's experienced her knows what generous, kind, intelligent, and hilarious person she is. And I just, I'm so fortunate that she grabbed my hand and pulled me into the pool. Wow. So when you were starting out, just, I mean, let's just kind of build the business on that, you know, first few months, even first few days. Christine says, here's the speaking business. Yes. Uh, You need a website. You need some topics. You need some video. You need some clients. How was the chicken or the egg story? You know, what was your first few gigs? How did you get them? What was the topic? How did that all crystallize? So the brilliant thing is I was actually running a speaking business without knowing it as a university professor. So in my courses, I was telling people, you know, a lot of it was around goal setting, goal achieving, you know, kind of how to chart your course, right? So (laughs) the very first talk was called, oh God, the Tammy Evans Adventure. And we always say, by the way, speakers, you you should not be you centric. You should be audience centric. Exactly. <laughs> Focus on serving them. Don't tell oh, your story. Yeah. Give them what they need. It's the Tammy Evans adventure. adventure. My novel called Mistakes Made in the Speaking Industry would rival War and Peace. And I've got two volumes on my shelf. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I jump in totally. So what it was about, so again, Christine's brilliance. She said, why not call it escape from someday aisle? Like someday I'll get to this. Someday I'll do that. Oh, she's a genius. So then it was quickly named that. And then it was really a program all about how to set a goal, how to achieve a goal. You know, I call it set a did it date. So you, you know, you had a date when it's got to be done. You get yourself a goalie, somebody that's going to help you. So this is great for your listeners because all of the things that I just said about setting a goal, you know, all the different tools and techniques around that exist in the world. But what I was able to do is create a Tammy way to say that. And that was coupled with my stories, my experience, things that happened to me, mistakes that I have made. And I'm able to deliver that in a language that links back to me so that the participants in whatever program I'm doing can remember the things because they're a little bit different or sticky, as people say, but also because it's just from my experience and how I can personally help people. So I took the things I was sharing with my students in class and then reworked that into a keynote and the structure that it needed to have and the stories that it needed to have and the sort of sizzle that it needed to have to be a keynote presentation. And that was the beginning. You know, recently I did the IMAX. I don't know if you've done an IMAX yet. They're awesome, right? I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, they had asked me to do the closing keynote and asked me also, could you do some, you know, learning things? This happens a lot in big conventions now where on the show floor, where all the vendors are, they will set up areas where they ask some of the main stage speakers to come in and do little learning segments. And I pulled out Escape from Someday Isle, Bank on Thanks, all of these very starter programs. And I chunked them into these learning experiences. And it was so great to look back at that beginning content and rework it for today. So that's tip number one. Go back and look at the things that really started. What turned you on and lit you up right when you started this business? And see if you can revisit it. See if you can kind of like modernize it for today and relaunch it in a way that might be really helpful for your participants. Hey, good looking. Are you currently getting paid to speak? Would you like to ramp that up? We can help. 
Book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team at doitmarketing.com slash call, and let's see what we might do together. The call is free, but the results may be priceless. You said something really, really interesting, both about most, I think most people that come into the speaking business come in from a training mode of some kind, right? So training, workshops, seminars, college professor. When they get to that keynote transition, I'm just channeling our listeners right now. They're going, Tammy, I'm a trainer. I've been doing this for 10 years or I'm out doing skill path or I'm a college professor. Keynote is a completely different animal. When you said I rejiggered all of my content to be in that keynote format and to be keynote friendly and to be packaged in that 30, 45, 60 minute keynote format, Did you have to learn that? Did you wing it? Did you watch a lot of other keynote speakers and say, I think this is how it should be repackaged? Or Because that's a whole art and science unto itself is take the trainer's brain and convert her or him into a successful keynote writing machine. How did you make that transition from training to keynote? There is a very different skill set in keynoting to training. And I think the biggest challenge, and it's a challenge for me to this day, is trying to put too much into the keynote. So you have so much to share and you have so much brilliance and so many tools and there's so many ways that you can help your participants and you have really 45 minutes. I always encourage people build a 45 minute keynote, even if it's a 60 minute spot, because I mean, David, you know this firsthand, nine times out of 10, your time gets shortened because the CEO wanted to say a few words or there was an extra award that we want to deliver and you want to honor that and you want to end your session on time. Oh my gosh, please end your session on time always. Okay, off of that. So moving from an area where you have the time and capacity to deliver more content into... And listen, I come from the world of entertainment. I have a master of fine arts. I call it a show. It's showtime. It is a performance that you are giving when you deliver a keynote speech. Now, I think that narrowing the content down to really engaging, memorable, and consumable bites is the most important thing of a keynote because you can have the most amazing ideas in the world, but if it's going past a certain amount of time, our brains just can't take them in. I use a story point application. So I tell a story, share what the point was, and ask them and share that with them how to apply that into their own lives and businesses. I started with this, I got away from it, and more and more I'm coming back to the interactivity that giving them time to interact with one another, networking, number one reason people go to conventions. So know this, in your keynote, the most valuable thing that you could probably share is an idea or an opportunity for your participants to network with each other. So the most important thing that you can tee up your participants has nothing to do with what you are saying. So when I talk about teeing them up, one of the things I give them is the ability to connect with one another. And I give them an open-ended or an activating question to ask each other so that they're not going, hi, what do you do? Here's my name. I instruct them introduce each other, exchange business cards, and answer this activating question with each other. Oh, and by the way, you have 90 seconds to do it, go. It gives them a risk-free way to connect with someone that they don't know in a space that is often highly fraught with anxiety if you're not one of those extroverted people. So that is a real gift that keynoters can give to their audiences is to give them a risk-free way to network either in the space, in the moment of the keynote, or as they encounter other attendees throughout the convention. And this is so, so important because I think we've come full circle, right? Back in the day, training was training, keynote was keynote, and keynote really was a show. Now, I think what meeting planners are asking for, and please validate me on this with your experience, they don't want the talking head one-way data dump keynote. They want what you're talking about. So it's like the revenge of the nerds. It's the revenge of the trainers. Like, oh, you know how to do an engaging 90-second activity? You know how to do something experiential in front of 2,000 people? You know how to get people talking to each other and you know how to bring them back so that your 45 minutes doesn't become a crazy circus? That's the keynoter that they want. They don't want the one-way data dump stage from the stage, correct? 
In my experience, that's true. I would never say across the board that, you know, anything is one way or the other because there are more meetings than we could ever even imagine. 7,000 a day, 7,000 business meetings per day in the U.S. Oh, that's a lot of pie. (laughs) A lot of pie, people. Sarah Michelle is a guru in our industry. I'm sure you know her through Velvet Chainsaw and NSA. She talks about experiential keynotes now are the the way of the future. And as a participant myself, I can understand that. Yeah, it's amazing to sit and listen to Mark Scherenbrock for 60 minutes. I mean, he is a storyteller, performer, motivational speaker, leadership speaker of, you know, unparalleled comparison. And yet he He's also- working on it. One day he'll be <laughs> He's good. working on One it. One day he'll be good. And he also has interactive moments, if you remember. He yeah. sprinkles interactive moments, allowing people to connect with each other and to connect with him. So I am not a polished keynoter. I think of a keynote as a conversation with the audience and I actually build in moments where I can have the audience call out things and respond to questions. And most of the time they are some of the funniest moments of the day. I think anytime you can make your attendees the star of the show is a beautiful moment for them and for the people around them. Because as you say, David, it is not the Tammy Evans adventure. It is the audience adventure. And so every time we can do that is really powerful. For sure. I think another guy who's just really good at this, I mean, you have to be, it's not like, oh, bring the audience up and let's see what happens. You have to have plan B, plan C, plan D. So you're masterful at it. The other guy that I think is masterful at it is Brad Montgomery. Oh, he is amazing with About his... making the audience the star of the show. I mean, he's a genius Absolutely. and he's hysterical, yes. but he also really does a lot of that audience engagement. He does. And the thing that I love that he does is the celebration that he has. The idea that he celebrates the participants so fully is wonderful. And he makes them feel so comfortable and at ease. And, you know, they engage and interact on such a high level with him. He's wonderful, brilliant. So let's talk about you have three points Mm. three points and a poem. (laughs) And we talked about this in preparation for our chat today. It's about be sellable, very important be seen, and be solo. And that applies to, I think, every speaker's business, but then there's also kind of a bureau twist that when we talk about speaker bureau partners who might be channel partners that help us get some additional gigs on the calendar, let's just talk about, in a general sense, those three key points that you like to share with your speaker colleagues and the people that come to you for some mentorship. Be sellable, be seen, be solo. Sure. Yeah. And so let me preface this by saying that this was specifically, those three points were specifically around being prepared to be a great bureau partner. So these three points link directly back to that. However, I think that they are very relatable and relevant for the speaking business in general. So to start with the idea of bureaus, the thing I encourage everyone to stop doing is thinking of bureaus as a what and thinking of them as a who. It isn't a bureau, a group, a team of people. It's really a bureau relationship is with one person. Even if it's a humongous organization that has 35 sales agents, you're dealing usually with one bureau partner. So if you start to think of them as a person, as an individual, and build your relationship around that idea, that's going to be a great way to start. That person that you're dealing with is making a major investment, not only a major investment because they're encouraging their client to spend their speaker budget on you as their keynoter, but they're making a major investment in their reputation as well. So that's very important to remember that there's a lot at stake for that person. So that's why these three things I think are going to help you as a speaker in your business and going to help you be the best bureau partner you can be. So the first one, as you mentioned, David, is be sellable. Imagine you have two keynote speeches. One of them has a book that is the companion piece. It has postcards that you've developed. It has a website built around it and a demo reel that highlights that keynote. You have a second keynote that maybe you've been working on for the past 10 months. It's brilliant. It's relevant. It's funny. It's landing beautifully. The audiences are loving it. You know that this is the future of your business. However, The website doesn't reflect that. The demo doesn't reflect that. You have no collateral around that yet. One of your clients calls and says, we're going into meeting with committee. We have all of the things about this. I need to sell you today at 3 p.m. 
which keynote do I sell? That client is going to want to sell the keynote with all the collateral around it because that shows 100% that you are invested in that keynote. That keynote is solid. You have delivered it. It has collateral behind it. The other one is a risk. And while they may feel like, oh, I believe you, it's great. They're probably not going to take the risk because the meeting is at three o'clock today. The same situation happens with your bureau partner. If they have two speakers, they have a speaker who is completely organized on their website. Everything that they need is in front of them. And then they have a speaker that they're like, well, they're very interesting. We've had a great conversation. I like the things that they've said. You're not going to make it to the shortlist because that bureau partner needs to have somebody solid with background collateral they can sell to their client because things happen so fast in this industry that you have to be sellable. So when I mean that, now we're going, you know, when you think about those two speakers that the bureau agent has to deal with, number one, you have to have video. People aren't even Googling speakers anymore. They're YouTubing them or Vimeoing them. They're, they're searching for speakers on video platforms because speaking is a visual tool that people are hiring you for. So video, and I remember being told this very early in my career, it probably still stands. Spend the amount on your video that you would hope to receive for your keynote fee. So it's a major investment. I will need to have an $80,000 video. Well, yes, you will. Because if you're swimming in those pools, David, (laughs) you better have a velvet floatable that you are. (laughs) Every every time that someone clicks on the video, they get a free Labrador retriever delivered to their doorstep with a box of chocolate and a box of champagne. That's an $80,000 video. And I would need a dog walker and a kennel to go with that. Done. (laughs) I want a dog. For you, done. (laughs) That's it. So invest, invest in your video. That's the best tool that you can give yourself, your business and your bureau partner and your client as they're trying to make this decision about the major investment. So I have your video. I would say the second most important thing is a really killer website. It's got to have all of the questions answered that a client or a bureau partner would need. And then the third part of that. So you've got your video, you've got your website, and then you need some proof. Listen, you are a marketing expert, David. You would never do this, but you know it is possible to market a product in a way that would leave the person being marketed to thinking that the product was one thing, one level of product, and then the product actually arrives and it's not exactly as it was marketed. So I think that the ability to show proof in your expertise, proof in your you know relationships from past experiences... And proof in your performance abilities when you are standing in front of a room of 10 people or 10,000 people is very important. So proof can be in the form of testimonials. It can be in the form of social media, what people have said about you, the pictures they posted along with the quotes that go with them. And yes, speakers need to understand that always the picture is going to be posted where you are making a face. You're not like this and your mouth is open and you know your chins are back so it looks like you have a newborn under there those are the pictures go ahead and show those as social media proof because usually what's going along with them is this talk changed my life or you know crushing it or whatever might go along with that so get out of your own way as far as that goes you can have your pretty headshots this is time for just showing that people you've impacted so Those are the tools you need for be sellable. Video, website, and proof. I actually just want to just tack on one quick thing about proof. I even raised the bar on that, Tammy. And I tell folks they need indisputable points Ah. of proof. Concrete evidence that you're awesome at what you do and that you will not make that meeting planner or conference producer or association executive regret hiring you. Absolutely. Well done. Yes. Indisputable proof. And David, while we're talking about this, you know, in there, I talked about testimonials, which you automatically think client testimonials, but there is real value in having meeting planner and AV team testimonials that say, this is a partner. This is a person who understands they are part of a production. They are not the production. You know, Ditch the diva. What a great idea. I never thought about that. Never thought of that. (laughs) But I I do. I'll tell you what I do. I'm sure you do this too, because we're not dummies. Our best friends are the AV team. Oh my gosh. The folks running the tech, the folks running the slides, the projectors, the microphones. I was in Germany and I had a fantastic 
interpreter. Don't call them a translator because they're an interpreter. And she wrote me this amazing, I never even thought about using this. David, you were incredible to work with. So professional, so kind. I sat down with her. I went over the slides. Anything else you need? Any questions? I have a weird sense of humor. I'm American. This is a pun. I'm going to pause here and let it sink in so that you have time to do. And that interpreter was my best friend because she had to be my best friend to do a great job for my audience. And she wrote me a beautiful handwritten card. And I'm like, that's gold. I never even thought of it as gold until you just said, AV team, behind the scenes people, easy to work with, not a prima donna, not a jerk. Yes. It really is. Well, how you treat someone is how you treat anyone. And yes, the AV team, I always tell them they're the most important people in the room. We are not seen or heard without them. And what you did for that interpreter shows that you are aware that you are part of a partnership. You are part of a production. And when you partner at that level, it is noteworthy. So I'm delighted that she wrote that. And yes, I would absolutely use that as a testimonial. For people who work with slide decks, so there are a few situations. One is that you will have your slides up on a screen and they will toggle back and forth between the iMeg and the slide. Nowadays, a lot of times we're actually getting slide and iMeg full. So when you have that situation where it's you full iMeg, usually a giant screen in the center with slides on the side, then your deck can be just your deck as far as having slide, slide, slide. But if you're in the situation where you're toggling back and forth between an iMeg and a slide deck, I found it very helpful for the AV team. If you print out your slides nine per sheet... I build in black slides. If I've got a long story coming up, I'll build in a black slide. If I print out the slide deck and hand it to the AV team with a circle around the black slides that say, this is coming, here's the slide before when this is coming, go ahead and pop up the iMag, leave that up there. And then I give them a cue, an out cue line. So they know when I'm about to go back into the deck and need to have an image come up again. The response from doing something like that is very similar to your golden note. They love you. Yeah, but it's so easy to do something like that to help the team. And what it does is it actually helps us communicate our message better. It's a better production overall, which is going back to your point. It makes it a better experience for the attendee. Right. Love it. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. All right. So that's be sellable. How about be seen? Okay. Be seen. The only exception to the scenario that I talked about earlier, that if a bureau partner has a speaker that has all of the tools in place and a speaker that they really like, but they really don't have anything to show someone, the only thing that would upstage the speaker that's completely prepared is if a bureau partner's trusted colleague said, you must book this speaker. They are out of this world, exceptional. They are the next new thing. You must do that. If a trusted person tells them that, they will put that unprepared speaker, they will put them in the pile because of word of mouth. So be seen is about showing what you do so that people can talk about you in circles and on levels that you might not even be, you know, prepared for online. So in order for that to happen, the number one key to being seen is be good. And I believe the only way to be good, and this comes from my performance training, is eat on the stage. I don't think you can shortcut feet on the stage. Speak, 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 and speak some more. Speaking begets speaking. And when I started, going back to the very beginning of this conversation, when I started, I would speak anywhere for anyone including Dewey Insurance Agency with a staff of 12 in the back room with the refrigerator humming and buzzing and clunking as it tried to make ice. I recorded it. 
I spoke, I recorded it, I used it as a training tool for myself. And then I did the same thing to a local small business women's group. Now these are absolutely for free. And usually I ended up giving away a book or a pamphlet, whatever I had so that I could leave myself in their hands. And I would do that time and time again. And just one story that came of this is that when I moved back to the East Coast, I spoke for one of those uh, women's networking groups to a woman whose sister was the event planner for Dove Chocolate. And the next year, I ended up being their opening keynote speaker, and they purchased one of my books for all 1,200 attendees. So that is a direct link to speaking leads to speaking, but it has happened on many levels in numerous ways across my career. And I still, to this day, I do about three charitable speeches per year. I do have to limit it. I would love to speak for anyone and any time that I could, but it just is not logistically possible. But I will do three keynotes per year. And usually it's people who have found me online and they have a cause that I believe in and I want to help move their mission forward. And if my words can help to do that, then it's my honor to do that. And of course, it usually leads to more speaking. So it's be seen. So be good, speak, invite people to come, invite people to come see you. You know, if you're speaking in the New York City area, look at the NSA NYC chapter website and we have over a hundred members you could invite to come see you. That's getting your colleagues to see you. Then you can look up bureaus who are nearby or meeting planners who are nearby. And I know eSpeaker has a really brilliant tool for this. And yes, you'll get lots of leads on that that you probably won't use, but you could reach out and invite people to see you. So be good, speak, invite people. And then my old school tool, and this is links directly back to my mentor and friend, Christine, is to send out postcards, old school, hard copy postcards that come across a desk in a very non-invasive way. People can read them, people can recycle them, whatever works for them, but it's being seen. And you do that in a personalized one-to-one way, like you're not going to batch and blast out 10,000 postcards to random strangers, correct? They are printed, but then I always write a handwritten note on all of them. Yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. Absolutely. No Let's batch and about, blast. Because I wrestle with this and I talk to a lot of smart people like you. And so I definitely don't have one set opinion, even though as a consultant, I have one set opinion, but I really don't have one set opinion. I believe just like you do, the more you speak, the more you speak. However where people start spinning their wheels on this, I'm going to go down to Ladies Auxiliary. I'm going to go down and talk at you know the library and do a free talk there. When you're doing intentional lead generating speaking, yes. you're not just going to do that for anyone, anytime, anywhere, for any fee. You're going to figure out who are the target rich environments that I would love to get in front of because my guess, my intelligent prospecting guess is that my next three to five paid gigs are hiding in that audience. And David, thank you for highlighting this. What I was speaking of earlier is really for emerging speakers, people who are building their business, people who are crafting their keynote, people who are just getting their feet on the stage. So, and I would say that's probably the first 12 to 18 months of a speaking business is to go and to those practice places. like building the muscle and building the conditioning to be a really great speaker. And getting, yes, and getting in front of people who then will. Many, many speakers that I have uh, asked this question about their journey, it's they're in an, speaking to an audience where someone was in the audience, exactly what you said. As you develop your speaking business and as you get further down the line, particularly if you have a consulting agency that goes along with it or a marketing agency as you do, David, then it is imperative that the gratis times that you do share your message from the platform, that it is for an audience that could give you, you know, as Andrew Davis says, stage side leads, you know, that is going to lead to more work. So you're absolutely right about that. The ladies auxiliary and the, you know, Rotary Club and the local schools and your area, those are all very, very valuable places when you're starting out. And it's not that they're not valuable places later in your career, particularly if you're building a new keynote, working on new material, if you have a new product, if you have a story you want to try in front of people, think of it like an open mic, right? I mean, it's an opportunity. Jerry Seinfeld, right? Multi-billionaire. He still does open mics, tries out new material. 
Absolutely. You know, Drew Tarvin is such a success. Another multi-billionaire. Another, <laughs> almost getting there, just around the corner. And no question, I have no doubt in my mind that he will be. Now he is a, just a rock star speaker, but also he goes to open mics all the time. He's trying out new content and material all the time at open mic nights. He wrote a book called The United States of Laughter, and he did comedy or spoke in all 50 states in a one-year period. It's a wonderful book, and it's a great training idea to just get up on your feet. Now, this is specifically talking about bureau partnership. This is not a an idea for how to run your business. That's a, a separate conversation. But for bureau relationship, I tell people to be solo because I want you to be your own bureau. I want you to have everything in place and be operating as if you were a bureau partner for yourself. Someone told me very early on that when you need a bureau, they are not interested in you. <laughs> And when you don't need a bureau anymore, that is when you will begin to form a bureau relationship. Now, that doesn't seem fair, (laughs) but it's absolutely true. And it's because of the reason I told you before, David, is that a client comes to a bureau partner and they have four hours to put three really rock star people in front of this client in order to find them the right speaker. And those three speakers need to be vetted, prepared, experienced, experts in their area, and ready to rock it if they were going to book them for tomorrow. So until you're at that point, forget about bureaus and just operate as your own PR, your own sales, your own you know operating system, everything that you need to do in order to run your business. And if you just do that, then you will A, either be noticed by bureaus and decide to partner with one eventually, or be noticed by bureaus and decide not to partner with one eventually. It's your choice at that point because you know the truly effective and outstanding bureau partners, they understand that it is a partnership and they want what's best for you as you want what's best for them. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Well, and here, I, there's two points I want to make about Be Your Own Bureau. Number one is a sense of detachment, right? If we're the speaker and we're selling ourselves and we are the product, so to speak, there's all kinds of stress and insecurity and craziness. If you detach yourself and say, I'm going to be the bureau agent for the speaker known as David Newman. And Tammy, you're the bureau agent for the speaker known as Tammy Evans. Yes. We just have this sense of detachment, like a third party. You know, Tammy would be awesome for your event. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> that's the mindset. Now, you, you don't say that. You know, you don't start quoting yourself like Bob Dole. Well, <laughs> Bob Dole thinks that blah, 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 blah. And yes, our listeners are old enough to remember who the heck Bob Dole is. But, <laughs> but that is awesome. The second thing I want to talk about with Be Your Own Bureau is you and Christine have this amazing relationship. I have this incredible relationship with a couple of people, Corey Perlman, Corey, and yeah. now people like this. Yeah. Ross Bernstein and Sam Richter, they're another odd couple. They tee each other up constantly for gigs. Talk a little bit about building a referral posse. Where yeah. oh, when yeah. does Christine tee you up? When do you tee her up? How does that work? And how do you guys build each other's business? The opportunity to work with a great bureau partner is a beautiful thing because we can doubly serve the client. When they bring me an opportunity that is their client and I am helping them to doubly serve that client. One of the ways that I can best do this is when I come off the stage, and I'm sure many of your listeners have had this experience, the client will say, they loved you. This was very powerful. Who can you help us with for next year? Who can you recommend? This is the opportunity that I have to say, I do have someone that would be perfect for your team for next year. And I say, I will, you know, let's say it's Blanche. I will say, I will make sure that Blanche gets that name to you and gets you hooked up for next year. Immediately when I return home from that event, I will tell Blanche in this case, I will say, Christine would be perfect for them for next year. You know, I will- Blanche is your bureau agent. Yeah, so Blanche is my bureau partner. So if I'm doing this with a bureau partner, it is best to go back to the bureau partner and say, Christine and I are represented by most of the same bureaus. So it's easy for us to say, you know, Christine would be perfect for this. She's on your roster. You're already up and working with her. You know, go ahead. And then I have already said to them, yes, this is the person that I think would be great. But never leave the bureau out of that recommendation. So when you're speaking about referrals, if you have come to that client through a bureau, 
that client belongs to the bureau. For sure. Make your referral to the bureau to the client. Does that make sense? Yeah. But even before, let's say we're not bureau ready yet. Okay. And now we're just, we're loving on our current client and saying, oh my gosh, you have to have Christine next year. Then you might do a three-way email between Christine and your client connecting them together, correct? Correct. If that is the situation. What I'd like to say about referrals in general, I highly recommend, it doesn't matter how close or how wonderful the person is to you in your life, do not recommend someone that you have not seen deliver a keynote in real life, in front of a real life audience. The reason is not because I want you to not refer your friend. It's because I want you to make sure that your referral is solid and that the client is going to be very happy with that referral. Because the relationship that you form with a client is forever. And they're probably going to circle back with you in a few years down the road and either have you again or bring you in. And and that time you've written a new keynote. So it's time to go do that event again. And for that reason, if an NSA member says, hey, I'm going to be in your area, go see them. And this goes back to be seen. This goes back to, you know, invite people that you're going to speak with. And then if someone invites you, go see them. It's a great opportunity to see our friends and colleagues in action. It's a great opportunity to watch how other people operate their businesses when they're on site. It's a development opportunity for you. And it's also a support opportunity for your colleague. And that way you can refer them after you've seen them. That links back to the see and be seen, I would say. Totally fantastic. So I'm going to ask you two final questions. The final, final question is how do people get connected and stay connected to the fabulous Tammy Evans experience, empire, oh God, adventure, no. whatever we're calling it today. <laughs> but even before I get to that question, second to last question, as folks are listening and marinating on all this amazing wisdom that you've shared with them, what's the one idea, one overarching idea or sort of summary idea that you would love them to go away with? Specifically based around our conversation today, David, I would say the one idea that I would want speakers who run a speaking business to go away with is that you are responsible for your speaking business. Don't wish or wait or hope for someone to notice you or sign you or book you or call you up on the phone or approach you at the stage. Be out there, be sellable, be seen and be solo as you run your business. Do it in a way that you feel at the end of the day, you've taken steps to broaden your outreach, to better your product, keep working on being good, and to connect. And that we can connect with people in our industry and we can connect with people outside of our industry. So again, for speakers as well as audience members, networking. Wise words, Tammy Evans. How do people get connected, stay connected? We're going to link up the show notes. We're going to do links and books and videos and whatever you want to share. Fire away. How do we get more Tammy? All right. Well, first of all, I was born during a seven-year period where the name Tammy existed. I am now nearly obsolete. Um, (laughs) And it's uh, the spelling. My mom thought she'd change it up a little bit. So I am T-A-M-I-E-V-A-N-S. Dot com. Uh, very simple. I, uh, if you put that in Google, I should come up pretty close to the top. But yes, yes. So just link me on TammyEvans.com. And social media, same thing? Sure. There's Twitter. Yes, at Tammy Twitter, Evans. Yeah. MySpace, absolutely. what? You'll find me. Okay. <laughs> and MySpace. <laughs> awesome, amazing book. The book is called Half Full of It, Activating Half Optimism it. and Other Hardcore Soft Skills. And the new book is called Lighten Up and Lead, but it's to be launched in the near future. <laughs> Ooh, so we're going to see if we'll get some Amazon links happening and people can tap into that as well. Great. Thank you so much, David, for what you do for our industry and for what you do for aspiring speakers, as well as speakers who are running successful businesses. I do believe that you are valuable and your tools and techniques are valuable for all levels of people who are running businesses in this amazing world that we live in. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're awesome. We're have to have you back. I mean, we could literally have talked for hours. So we'll, we'll have you back again. Sounds great. Anytime. Thanks, David. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe. Tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 